Um, when we think about wildland deployments, you know, we see on the news these big flames, we see fire engines responding. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Usually what happens is, is that a local community is responding to a brush fire or something that just seems to be growing. And it quickly gets past their, their, their needs and their ability to support it. So they, they reach out to their next closest stations and those respond. And it just keeps drawing more and more support and units to that scene. Eventually somebody's going to go, we need more than this. This is growing far beyond our capacity. So either through contracts with Department of Natural Resources, Forest Service, or the state mobilization process, they reach out to the state and say, we need help. So the state says, okay, and they start the mobilization process. What mobilization looks like is as we look for those like types of resources, those things that we need, are they fire engines? Are they aid cars? Are they medic units? Are, what are the resources needed? We go and find them. It's literally on a, like a Rolodex on this list of things we go bring up. So as those get called out, there's a process. Those crews are not usually immediately at work and we just send them. We, we have to establish and bring them together. And then we ship them off in strike teams, which are five like units plus a supervisor. We can ask for dozens of strike teams from around the state to meet these needs. That is immediately, in short order, hundreds of additional firefighters. But as we're fighting those fires and protecting property and dealing with that issue that's growing, guess what? The community is still living. It is still having needs of what we would call 911. Who's gonna call and come for my medical emergency? Who's gonna deal with the car accident? So one of the things that strike teams can do when they're beyond just like a wildland, we can have medic units, we can have aid cars, we can have normal fire engines. And their job is to not only protect the community from that wildfire, but also to respond to the day in and day out types of calls that go on. So again, it's not just about wildland, but it is about neighbors supporting neighbors, and that's how we do that through mobilization. For us, uh, it's type three. It's got 700 gallons of water, which uh, 200 gallons more than a traditional fire truck does. Um, it's four wheel drive, so it can get us into areas that a traditional fire truck just can't make it to. Higher wheels um, off the ground, you know, so we're able to take you know hills and ditches, get into this really nasty terrain that you know obviously your traditional fire truck just cannot do. Um, it's got multiple pumps on it. Um, ones that are meant to you know, flow you know, less water, but are able to, to run longer and not burn up fuel. Where you imagine if you had your traditional fire truck flowing all day, you know, you'll have so much fuel. Where this thing can go all day, all night, and continue on. You know, a lot of times we'll go into neighborhoods, you know, on a hill in eastern Washington, and our job is prep this neighborhood. Whether that's you know cutting down trees, you know pulling wood away from decks, whether it's wrapping it, you know with fire retardant um, materials, uh, we can get a lot of work done with four people. So that would be the ideal personnel for this rig. We can make everything made together and work regardless of where we're at, which kind of force it is, whether it's Forest Service land, DNR, um, you know, or a local jurisdiction. Traditional firefighting tools for when we're actually in the city. Um, and occasionally you got to put out a house fire, you know, if it's, you know, kind of a standalone house. We want to save property, you know, life property, the environment are the things that the fire service is always uh, trying to protect. You know, let's just say the fire's out of control. It's the initial phases of the fire, the incipient stage. So you're getting there and everything's burning around you. You have the ability to turn this thing on, do some pump and rolling, do a quick hit without getting out and pulling your hose out. It's just a way to stop something. So you see, hey, we're about to lose this neighborhood. It's going up the hill. Um, we got to get a stop here. And you can show up, do a quick attack while everybody else is jumping out and getting set up. It's just another tool we have to be able to uh, to mitigate the fire. You go to a lot of non-hydrated areas in eastern Washington or even around here we have non-hydrated areas. That's why we have water tenders. 3,000 gallons go a long way especially in a wildland firefighting scenario. So um, this will show up with the strike team um, of you know engines of um, you know type 3 engines you know which don't have quite as much water. So this will park at the bottom of the hill all the brush rigs will go up into the hills, put out hot spots, when they run out of water, they'll come back down and refill. You know, or we can take the uh, fold tank, which is inside of here. You fold this down and it's a 3,500 gallon tank, like a big old swimming pool. You drop that and you can dump the water from the tank, drop it in. The engines can come in, they can draft water out of the pool. 
um, and that can be the water supply, and then we'll drive off by find the nearest hydrant, which in eastern Washington, you know, it could be miles away, you know, or it could just be down the hill. Um, depending on how far away our water source is, you know, you may need to get multiple high, um, tenders coming. So if we had a huge, a huge fire going on, um, you may have three, four, five of these going just round trip dropping water off. Um, if we're in remote areas in eastern Washington, you know, you may, hey, it's two hour turnaround time, so use your water sparingly. So when we're deployed and we're on the fire scene, once we've checked in and the fire knows we're there, that is the fire administration knows we're there, anytime we're out of our rigs, we have to have web gear on, we have to have fire shelter, we've got to have gloves, eye protection, a helmet, um, we should have drinking water, so most of us carry you know, a, a bottle, some of us have hydration packs on. Um, so we got to be ready, ready to go, and ready to stay safe. So we'll have uh, Nomex gear on, um, Nomex pants. Uh, we'll have a brush shirt or a brush coat on as well. And then you should almost, you should always have a hand tool as well. So there's, if you're working on a hand line, um, you know, you'll have different tools based on where you're positioned in it. So something like this to clear uh, brush, grass, duff, litter away from the fire line or other items. Um, we'll also bring a Pulaski somewhere on that line. Um, we can obviously work with brush and roots and, and clear that out of the way as well. We'll typically have a shovel, um, other hand tools like a McLeod as well. You got to think about everything that you might need, food, water, um, if you have any medications that you're on, uh, first aid, I have a, this whole top pouch of my pack is, uh, is all first aid items. Um, so we have a lot of bee stings that happen out uh, when we're fighting fires, um, blisters, um, cuts, abrasions, I've um, got to be able to take care of all of those. Um, and then even just common colds and congestion. We get a lot of sinus irritation from the smoke and dust. Um, so decongestions and other things, uh, gotta prepare for those. And we burn a lot of calories. And then we need to have um, some type of shelter, um, some means to, to get some rest when that time comes. Um, so tents, uh, sleeping bags, although oftentimes it's too hot, <laughs> so you just lay on top of them. Um, some guys bring hammocks um, to try to find some comfortable bare ground. To... First and foremost, it, it's hard to kind of educate yourself. I'm excited to get out and see on social media some of these really great camping sites to go to on Forest. Um, all these great places to visit and you want to go out and you want to camp, you want to have a campfire, you want to keep warm, you want to cook food. Um, just make sure that it's contained, that it's uh, done safely down at the mineral soil level, that you put that fire out and uh, pay attention to what people are saying uh, when they're telling you that it's a red flag event and that we can't have fires. Because although from the general public you don't necessarily know uh, the, the worst case scenario, what can happen with that, a little bit of wind, a little bit of angle on the land, the topography, and that fire can go anywhere from being just a little fire outside of a ring to devastating the land. And Only you can prevent wildfires. <laughs>